long time ago. There was a beautiful country. In that country lived good people and bad people. The bad people made being bad seem quite nice. And sometimes the good people forgot they were good. And it became quite hard to tell the difference between the two. So along came a very important bad soldier who was in charge of lots of other bad soldiers who weren't quite so important. He had lots of horses and chariots for the soldiers to use to fight with, and no one could beat his armies. But one day, after a very big battle, the important soldier was being chased. He ran to the tent of a lady that he thought was a friend. Hello, Mr. Soldier, she said, knowing who he was. You can come hide in my tent. And she showed him a place to hide and pulled a blanket over his head. I'm very thirsty, the bad soldier said from under the blanket. I'm sure you are, and I bet you're hungry too. So she brought the soldier a plate of chocolate chip cookies she had just pulled out of the oven and a nice cold glass of milk. Mmm, thank you. Now, go make sure that no one is coming, he said, dunking his last chocolate chip cookie into his milk. Tell them I'm not here. And then, because he was very tired from being bad all day, he fell asleep with cookie crumbs and milk in his mustache. Then, J.L., for that was her name, tiptoed to the corner where she kept the extra pegs that she used to put up her tent. She picked up a peg in one hand and a hammer in the other. They were very heavy, but she was very strong. She tiptoed back to where the man was sleeping, took aim, and hammered her tent peg into the side of his head all the way down to the floor. It killed him quite dead. The good people were very happy and sang a song about her bravery. And the good people remembered they were good for 40 years and lived happily until they were bad again. The end. Um, J.L. was a very real person living in the middle of history in the days of the judges. Um, about 1300 to 1200 BC, depending on who you read. And um, she came after Joshua led the people into Israel. And um, she, uh, her story is probably a little bit before Ruth, or it is a little bit before Ruth and before the period of the kings. So if you were part of our Wednesday night Bible study, you know that Judges was a very rough time in Israel's history. And Throughout Judges, there's a sin cycle that we see repeated over and over. Um, and every story that we read in Judges, including JL's, is part of that cycle. Uh, the cycle, rest, you can remember it from the R's. It's five R's instead of three. Rest, relapse, ruin, repentance, and restoration. And there was that 40 years for JL, and then it started all over again. So um, Judges chapter 2, verses, starting with verse 11. I don't, there are so many scriptures today that they're not up on the screen, but if you have your Bible or your phone app, follow along as much as you can. So here's a picture of, the, um, of this cycle, this sin cycle. The Israelites did evil before the Lord by worshiping the Baals. They abandoned the Lord God of their ancestors who brought them out of the land of Egypt. They followed other gods, the gods of the nations who lived around them. They worshiped them and made the Lord angry. They abandoned the Lord and worshiped the Baal and the Ashtoreths. The Lord was furious with Israel and handed them over to robbers who plundered them. He turned them over to their enemies who lived around them. They could no longer withstand the enemy's attacks. Whenever they went out to fight, 
the Lord did them harm, just as he had warned and solemnly vowed he would do. They suffered greatly. The Lord raised up leaders who delivered them from these robbers. And the deliverers that we see throughout Judges, and the judges in here are not like Judge Judy. They're, they're deliverers, and the ones that he raised up helped deliver them from these cycles of sin that they were in, led them into battle. So um, that's where we are with Jael. And there's a scripture that I'd like you to keep in mind. I think the guys have um, a slide of it. So we're going to read Jael's story, and we're going to bounce a little bit to do that. But through this, through this scripture, keep this in mind and look for what you see in there. When the leaders took the lead in Israel, we're in Judges 5, verse 2, verse 1 and 2. When the leaders took the lead in Israel, when the people answered the call to war, praise the Lord. We have praise at the beginning, praise at the end, our worship. That's why we start our, our church service with worship, because our worship it, it encompasses everything and brings the work of the Holy Spirit into, into our time before them. So we're going to read Judges 4. That's where Jael's story is. But um, it's kind of interesting because we've got the, uh, the narrative of the history. And remember, history is all part of his story. And that's what we see throughout Scripture. And um, some of the story is uh, reiterated in song in chapter 5. So we remember that while it's real and it's giving us facts, it's also, chapter 5 is also um, poetry. So, so it's, you know, it has some poetic license in there. So let's uh, go through this text. I'll uh, start in verse 1. That's always a good place. Here's the beginning of that sin cycle. The Israelites again did evil in the Lord's sight after Ehud's death. Go back and read Ehud, about Ehud. He's a very interesting guy. The Lord, somebody's laughing because you know. Um, the Lord, here we go, turned them a over to King Jabin of Canaan, who ruled in Hazor. The general of his army was Sisera, who lived in the... I didn't practice this one ahead of time. The Harasheth Hag Hagoyim. That wasn't too bad, right? All right. Um, the Israelites cried out for help to the Lord because Sisera had 900 chariots with iron-rimmed wheels, and he cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years. Um, now, 900 chariots. It's really interesting because earlier in the book we hear of someone else with 900 chariots and it says the Israelites could not drive them out. Well, that we know, you know, if they could not, that was because they were not relying on the power of God, right? Because I don't think he really cares a whole lot about the 900 chariots with um, of iron. And um, that was also in that time period, it, it was a symbol, or not just a symbol, it was high technology then. You know, these were, were like bow and arrows against, I don't know, some missile or something. Um, so, uh, let's go down a little bit further. Uh, verse 6, we'll start. So, it starts... Uh, let me back up a little bit. We've got Deborah, who was one of the judges, and she was also a prophetess. Her leadership looked a little bit different than some of the other judges, but we see that she was a very strong and godly leader. And in verse 6, it says, She summoned Barak, son of Abinamon, from Kadesh and Naphtali. She said to him, is it not true that the Lord God of Israel is commanding you? Go march to Mount Tabor. She tells him to take 10,000 men with her from two of the tribes. And she said, I will bring you Sisera, the general of Jabin's army, to you at the Kishon River, and I will hand him over to you. She reminded him, 
Is it not true that God said he would deliver? Uh, verse 14b, there's a lot here, and it's all an important part of the story, but I'm trying not to just read it all to you. Uh, so down to 14, we read, When Sisera heard that Barak, son of Abinamon, had gone up to Mount Tabor, he ordered all of his chariots, 900 chariots with iron-rimmed wheels. You know, in Hebrew, when, it, when the scripture repeats itself, that means that we need to pay attention. So I think the scripture wants to reiterate what a big deal these 900 chariots of iron, what a big deal they were to the Israelites. And, you know, like I said earlier in Judges, we see that as well. And if the enemy finds something that works, why should he come up with something new? So here we see that Barak went up Mount Tabor. He got his plans on the mountain. Good place to get our plans, right? And then he went down to the valley to fight. Well, this doesn't make a lot of sense on human warfare terms because the valley is where the chariots were the most effective, but it's also the place that God could show up the most. God's plan was more powerful here. And, um, you know, we, pl we pray for, uh, let's try that again. We pray for plans and, and not necessarily a bad thing, but maybe sometimes even more so we should pray for a movement of God. And let's skip down a little bit and see what happened next. Ah, sorry. I need that little wax sticky stuff up here. Um, so verse 15. Y'all, you know what? I left my glasses at home, so I'm like this. The Lord routed Sisera, all his chari chariotry, and all his army with the edge of the sword. And Sisera jumped out of his chariot and ran away on foot. Well, let's find out why Sisera jumped or ran away on foot. As I said, the song in Deborah 5, it kind of retells the story, but it also gives us some details. Uh, so in verse 6 of chapter 5, it says, In the days of Shamgar, son of Anath, in the days of Jael, caravans disappeared. So Shamgar is a, um, a judge back in chapter 3. He was interesting too. God gave these judges all kinds of weapons. Shamgar's weapon was an ox goad. And that doesn't make a ton of sense until we read a little bit further. God chose, it says warriors were scarce, remember? Um, and it tells us that the travelers had to go on winding uh, side roads because they were too afraid to travel on the main highways. And it, it says the warriors were scarce until you arose, Deborah, until you arose as a motherly protector in Israel. God chose new leaders. Then fighters appeared in the city gates. But I swear, not a shield or a spear could be found. Now, I kept thinking, how did they fight? How did they chase them out with the edge of the sword when they had none? Then I reread it several times, because I'm a little slow sometimes, and saw it says, it doesn't say there wasn't a sword. It said there wasn't a shield or a spear. Now, think about that. A spear was long, and they threw it. And the shield was for defense. But a sword, you can get up close and personal. So that was the ultimate thing that they needed to fight with in this. And, you know, sometimes we want to fight from a distance. And God's like, no, you have a sword. Get up close and personal. So that's one of the reasons that Shamgar had to go in with an ox goad. He, you know, that, you can kind of sneak an ox goad in because everybody, you don't have to sneak it. Everybody has one. And it says that he killed six hundred Philistines with that ox goad. I don't know how, but I believe he was empowered by the work of God. 
So a, a leader rose up and led, and the people answered the call. So let's go back and fit back into the narrative in Judges 4, 15, and 16. And we read part of that. We're going to read it again. The Lord routed Sisera. The Lord routed Sisera. All his chariotry and all his army with the edge of the sword. Sisera jumped out of his chariot and ran away on foot. Back to chapter 5. See, that's why I said you got to follow along with me. And we'll read uh, verses 4 and 5. Because it's a song, they'll tell what's going to happen. They'll go back and give details. And the poetry in it is beautiful. So, um, 5 verses 4 and 5. O oh Lord, when you departed from Seir, when you marched from Edom's plains, the earth shook. The heavens poured down, the clouds poured down rain, the mountain trembled before the Lord, the God of Sinai, before the Lord God of Israel. So as we read on, we see that um, this defeat, you know, like I said, it didn't make a whole lot of sense to go down in the valley, except that in the valley was the river Kishon. And God brought on a storm and flooded the river Kishon. And it's interesting, it was not really a time of year for, for that to happen. And Kishon, in, in its normal state, was not that big. But where else do we see God taking out men in chariots by flooding them over with unexpected water? Yes, Red Sea. And I believe that that's one of the reasons that it keeps emphasizing and emphasizing the chariots that couldn't be overcome because we know from Israel's past history that they could be. So now is when we come to our little strong housewife friend, J.L., and her story is told in both chapters as well, but we're going to look at it in Judges 4. We see it also in chapter 5 in verses 24 through 27, if you're wanting to look it up later. Uh, so here we go. Now, Sisera ran away on foot. He was on foot because his chariot was bogged down in mud. His great weapon was no longer uh, useful to him. He ran away on foot to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. Now, the Kenites were distantly related to Moses through his father-in-law. So they were friends, you know, they were kind of kissing cousins. But uh, Hazor tells us earlier had moved up from away from his family. And back then, it's not like just getting in, you know, the U-Haul and driving where you can fly back and see your friends later. It's very intentional when you move away from something. And he moved away from his people and into the enemy territory and it says, Heber the Kenite had made a peace treaty. So what does that tell us about Heber? Jael came out to welcome Sisera. She said to him, stop and rest, my lord. So Sisera stopped to rest in her tent. And she did, she really put a blanket over his head. I can't find the cookies part. But he did ask for water, and she gave him milk. There's all kinds of speculation on that as to why she gave him milk. Maybe it was a more hospitable thing to do. Maybe it was, you know, milk supposed to uh, kind of put you to sleep. But he told her to stand watch at the, at the door, at the entrance to the tent. And he said, if anybody comes, you tell them and ask you, is there a man in here? In here, you tell him no. So Jael, the wife of Heber, it keeps reminding us that Jael was the wife of Heber, this man who had deserted his own people to make friends with the enemy. It never tells us that about Jael. It doesn't say she's an Israelite. It doesn't say she's a Kenite. We don't know. But we know through this passage that who she was around did not define her. And God does not define you through your circumstances, through the people around you. 
He defines you by what you are in him. And she really did take a tent peg. Now, from what I understand, these were big. These were not dinky little things. And she drove it through his head. And I'm sorry, the kids I thought would be downstairs. But uh, it's real, you know, it is real. Now, I've thought a lot about how, I, sh I was going to say about driving a tent peg, or tent peg through someone's head, but um, I really, it, it's, you know, I really don't think about that. I just wonder how she did it. Now, I believe they were, they were pretty big because their tents were big. And how many of y'all have driven a, a, a tent peg? I know you have. All right, see, can you do it with, all the way into the ground with just one blow? No, not, not just those little metal ones that come with the tent. She was a woman. So strength was a little different. Another thing, when you, even when you drive a nail, um, Phil, can you just do it blindfolded? I mean, you might be able to because you do it all the time, but you have, to, you have to line up, right? Yeah, you should, to actually hit the nail. So she's, she's what's that? She's um, thinking through this. Can you imagine... One, yeah, Tony just went pop, and it had to be. She couldn't hesitate. I mean, I'd be thinking, all right, what if he wakes up? Well, if she would have barely tapped that tent peg the first time around, he would have woken up. This was an opportunity that was brought before her, and I believe firmly that it was brought before her by God. And she grasped that opportunity. She could not hesitate. She didn't hesitate. And she drove it straight through his temple all the way into the ground. Now that took some strength. And evidently she already had some because um, of the type of work that she did. But also I believe that, that that accuracy, that aim, and that power also comes from the power of God, not just what's within ourselves. The women in that time period were the ones who put up the tent. She had a tent peg ready over there in the corner somewhere. She knew how to wield it. And God gives, he doesn't just send us out into battle empty-handed. He expects us to use what's in our tent, use what's in our hand to fight the battle, and he gives us the victory. And she was very opportunistic when she needed to be. Then um, it goes on, and still in chapter 4, and she, it, it does talk about her tiptoeing up. That was not just dramatic. She drove the tent peg through his head, and it says, Now Barak was chasing Sisera. Jael went out to welcome him. She said to him, Come here and I will show you the man you are searching for. He went with her inside the tent, and there he saw Sisera sprawled out dead with the tent peg through his temple. Now, I've thought about that a lot too, and, and I have to wonder if not only did Jael want uh, this uh, leader, Barak, to know that Sisera, Sisera was dead, I think that maybe she might have already been thinking, what is going to happen when my husband gets home? Come and get this dead body out of my tent. Because remember, they were, they were friends. That was another thing that she had faith over. She put everything else behind her and did what she was supposed to do. Um, it seems pretty brutal. We don't think that way today. We think of... Um, maybe rightfully fair trials and fair imprisonment. And uh, this guy had already gone through his trial. He was, um, he was very evil. He was very wicked. And uh, over in chapter 5, it, towards the end of it, it tells a little bit about him. Uh, later, you know, we have Jael who took care of it. We know that uh, Barak knows what happened. But then we switch back to uh, Sisera's mother. And it says, through the window she looked, 
Sisera's mother cried out through the lattice, why is his chariot so slow to return? Why are the hoofbeats of his chariot horses delayed? So, you know, mom's worried, but before you feel too sorry for the mother, she has these women around her, kind of like ladies in waiting, and um, it says she even thought to herself, she reminded herself, you know, it takes a little longer after winning the battle. Uh, no doubt they are gathering and dividing the plunder. And I'm going to paraphrase here because this version is quite graphic. Maybe they're gathering women as bounty. So here, J.L.'s husband is friends with a man that goes after women like that. And when J.L. staked him in the head, she didn't, she didn't only stake an enemy of Israel, but she staked the enemy of women everywhere. And I believe that's a thought we can really get behind. So it was a matter of possibly defense and also defense of the women around her. So we have leaders who led. Deborah, back in early chapter 4, we, say, we see that she delivered a word from God. And Barak, he answered a call to war too. And I didn't read that, so we're going to skip back to it a little bit. She said, has not the Lord said? Has he not given you a message? She gave him the directions, and he said, If you go with me, I will go. But if you do not go with me, I will not go. She said, I will indeed go with you, but you will not gain fame on the expedition you are undertaking, for the Lord will turn Sisera over to a woman. Deborah got up and went with Barak to Kadesh. And we see through the story that um, they, both, they both worked together. But Barak was the one who went up on the mountain. And Barak was the one who charged into the valley. And Barak is the one mentioned in Hebrews 11 as having great faith. Now, it's like, Why? God saw something there, and maybe his response, I, I believe he was not wrong in asking the prophetess of the Lord to go with him. That happened, and that's not a bad thing, but maybe he should have phrased it a little differently. I'll go, and I would like for you to go with me. But he said, I'll only go if you go. But somewhere in there, somewhere marching up the, uh, somewhere collecting the chariots, somewhere um, marching up the mountain, maybe marching down, he got, his faith was developed and it matured, and he became a soldier truly fighting in the power and moving forward in the power of the living God of Israel. So Deborah delivered the word, Barak a little reluctantly, received it, and he responded. And then we have J.L. who took the opportunity given her and killed the enemy in her tent. I think it's interesting that the enemy was in her home. He was routed out. His chariot was bogged down, and he ran. And where did he run? He ran to the home. And we might fight the enemy on the outside, our spiritual battles, but one of our biggest spiritual battles takes place in our homes. And that's a place where we not only fight for our own spiritual well-being, but we fight for the spiritual well-being of those that God has put around us. The people answered. Some, of the ver some versions, and probably the one you have in front of you, says the people volunteered. But this works together. I think the Hebrew is a little um, odd in that area. And the people volunteered. When the people answered the call to war, 
That's a responsibility, and it is part of volunteering. I mean, we think of volunteering as uh, volunteering to mop the floor or help open the church or um, whatever that may look like here in the body, and also uh, perhaps volunteering for uh, service in other areas of the community. That is part of battle. It really is, but it's not the only part. So let's quit thinking of the word volunteer as a nice little thing we do at the food bank and thinking of it as part of war. Uh, it will change our mindset a bit. Now, it wasn't everyone that answered. Um, I believe it was nine tribes that Barack and Deborah went to, and only four and a half answered the call. Uh, that's back in, in chapter 5, like I said, uh, verse, starting with verse 14. It tells they came from Ephraim, who uprooted Amalek. I love the way it's talking about past victories and reminding them. They follow after you, Benjamin, with your soldiers. So um, it goes down, and we see these, these tribes that do volunteer, and then we see the tribes kind of in that, instead of Faith Hall of Fame, we see them in the Faith Hall of Shame, the tribes that didn't answer. Issachar's leaders were with Deborah. The men of Issachar supported Barak. In the valley, they were sent under Barak's command. However... Among the clans of Reuben, there was intense, search, intense heart searching. Why do you remain among the sheepfolds? Remember, this is Deborah singing this song. Listening for the shepherds, playing their pipes for the flocks. As for the clans of Reuben, there was intense searching of heart. I didn't read the same verse twice. It's in there two times. Remember, when it's in there more than once, we pay attention. What was with Reuben? What was he doing his intense searching about? Well, we do that too. We listen, we listen, we try to listen. We look inward like, you know, little Buddhas uh, gazing at their belly buttons. But an introspection is good because introspection, and we're going to talk about this in a little bit, introspection is the time that we hear from God and maybe find out why we're not hearing him, maybe just being quiet and letting him talk, letting prayer be a two-way street where we're not just telling him what we want, but asking him to tell us what he wants. However, introspection without action accomplishes nothing. Then we have, a, it says Gilead, and that's actually another name for the tribe of Gad, stayed put beyond the Jordan River. Stayed right where they were. Now beyond the Jordan River, it's very intentional in mentioning that because when Joshua led the people into the promised land, you had, I believe it was two and a half tribes that stayed behind. They said, or they tried to stay behind. They said, all right, we like this land over here. Can we have it? And Joshua said, you can have it. You can settle your families there, but you're going to go battle with us first, and then you can move back. I don't know why those tribes settled for something less than God had for them. But here we see that Gad wanted to stay settled in less than God had for them. And then Dan, the tribe of Dan, why did he seek, she says, this is interesting, why did he seek temporary employment in the shipyards? And it doesn't just say he was working in, the, or they were working in the shipyards, it says they sought temporary employment. That sounds to me like a uh, slightly convenient excuse. So when do we do that and why? Why do we stay where we are for something that's temporary, laying our treasures up on earth instead of in heaven? Maybe personal gain, comfort, 
You know, it's a lot com more comfortable when I'm here in what I know than venturing into the unknown that maybe God's calling me to, but I don't know what it looks like, so I don't want to do it. Um, employment. You know, if, if God were to call us as individuals into something that seemed rather iffy, I mean, remember these were 900 chariots that they couldn't drive out. So why leave your nice, cozy home and your good job that you temporarily got for something that they didn't know and where there was actually pretty certain defeat, right? And I would say that the main reason that we stay in, the, in that place is fear. And I, I have heard people stay home from the mission field that God was calling them to because they were scared of what would happen to their kids. Now, that's, that's real. I mean, we have to be judicious in what we do or we're foolishly putting our families at risk. But if God calls you somewhere, you're safe in some way or another, right? Because he loves our kids more than we do. Then we have Asher. Asher remained on the seacoast. They, they were another one that moved over. He stayed by his harbors. Asher just said, that's okay. I'm comfortable where I am. This, I'm on the beach. I've got a beach house. This feels pretty good. John Trapp said, the sedentary life is most subject to diseases. Standing waters soon putrefy. It is hard and happy not to grow worse with liberty. But there were tribes who stayed, or tribes who went with Barak, um, stayed with, their, with uh, what God had called them to do. The men of Zebulun were not concerned about their lives. How much could we accomplish for the Lord if our own lives, our treasures here on earth, our physical life, how much more could we accomplish if we weren't afraid and we didn't? We weren't concerned about our own lives. And, you know, Jesus was pretty clear on that. He said, don't take any thought for tomorrow. And he told us, don't lay up your treasure on earth. And um, what do we see with the apostles? They all gave their lives for, for the Lord and for the gospel. Uh, Eleven of them, from, from what we see in, in secular history, most of them, except, except for John, died martyr's death, and John died in exile, and I'm sure that wasn't pleasant. Naphtali charged onto the battlefields. That tribe, they didn't, they didn't hesitate. They charged down. And there were some, some others that it tells us about further up. For us, we have to ask with that small bit, of introspection. If we aren't effectively reaching the world for Jesus, if we aren't as individuals living in personal victory, everything seems stagnant, everything seems oppressed, we have to ask ourselves, we have to look at why. We look at our chariots, we say, why? Aren't we driving them out? And you know, introspection isn't all that did it. It's upward inspection, asking the Holy Spirit to show us what's going on in our lives, uh, what seems almost too daunting to overcome, and what are we unwilling to give up? That takes some deep searching and when you ask the Holy Spirit to reveal something to you, when we ask him to show us what's up and what's messed up in our lives, we need to expect him to do it. We need to want to. And that might be a very uncomfortable. In fact, I'll, I'll pretty much guarantee you it's going to be uncomfortable because he's convicting us. What would happen if we all said, God, convict us. Show me 
What's going on that's blocking me from freely serving you? What are we unwilling to give up? And that's the people that charged forward with Barak. Barak decided it was worth him giving up. The tribes decided it was worth them giving up. You know, here we look at our, um, our body, the body of Christ as, as a whole. We look at it globally. We look at the body of Christ in, in our country. In fact, for us as Americans, that's how we tend to see the spread of the gospel in the state of the church. But it is very different in some other countries than it is here. And you know what brought it out strong? A lot of times, persecution. And the, the people spreading the gospel have grown into maturity and not this almost post-Christian era that we have going on in the United States. And then we take a look at um, the, our body in this church. You know, that's, that's the different portions of the body that you could say that we're a part of with globally, in our country, and in our church. And this isn't a bad thing because it is a body. And my part in the body is important. And your part in the body, whether it's big, whether it seems big or small to you, it's important because if one member of the body is weak, it weakens the whole body. You've heard the thing, if you lose your big toe, it really throws you off. Otherwise, when, you know, we don't think about our big toe a lot unless you're a woman and you're trying to paint your toenail. But Judges 4.1 says the Israelites again did evil in the Lord's sight. He turned them over to King Jabin and it took 20 years of bondage before they cried out for help. Feeling unable to overcome their bondage. Now, the story of Deborah and Barak and Jael, it's not an allegory, but we do see some parallels. And I think this is, that's one of my favorite parts about the history in the Old Testament, is we can compare it to what we've got going on today and see really great parallels of how God can work in us, how God can deliver his people from bondage as a nation and as individuals. The people fought... And God delivered, and the leaders had to respond, and the people had to respond. Now, our pastor regularly offers us opportunities for war. He helps us examine inside and look at opportunities from the outside. And scriptures regularly offer us opportunities for war and they also show us how to have victory and it's our authoritative word and directions from God because we're reminded in scripture the enemy is not those around us we don't uh, war against flesh and blood right against principalities and powers and the rulers of darkness of this world and we wonder how to do it and James lays it right out that there for us he says if you lack wisdom ask of God and I believe that we regularly ask God how to fight and we don't always ask him who we are fighting and I think the people that we name as our enemies the things that we name as our enemies that's not necessarily in fact often it's not who the real enemy is our enemies not the weird unsaved neighbor next door it's not the drug addict on the street it's not the opposing political party and it's not Hollywood our enemy is spiritual and we know that because that's what Ephesians 6 tells us. So if those aren't the enemies, why as Christians in a free country, in this, our national body of Christ, why are we walking defeated by politics, entertainment, and an immoral worldview? See, that answer lies with that introspection. That answer lies within us. 
So the question isn't, what's the government doing wrong? What's Hollywood doing wrong? What's the opposing party doing wrong? The question really, when you dig down deep, isn't even, what am I doing wrong? We have to ask God, what is it within me that's bringing defeat? Bob did a beautiful lead-in with the verses telling us that we're supposed to love one another. And, you know, Jesus said that's the second greatest commandment. So the problem might not be, and I ask myself this, you know, why, why can't I, why don't I do this? But the, the problem with us might not be sharing, that we're not sharing the gospel, not sharing Jesus with my neighbor. The problem really is why? Why am I not compelled to share Jesus with those around me, even when it might be awkward or hard? And the answer, I don't love Jesus or my neighbor enough. I'm not fully committed to the greatest commandment. So what can I do about that? What can we as individuals and as a body do to that, do about that? Well, you know, um, We've seen in Asbury, and many of you have been following what's going on in Asbury, and I think the president there was very wise in the way he termed it. He said, we can't call this a revival because the only thing that determines if it's a revival and shows that is long term. He said, but it is a movement of God. And I need to ask myself, where do I start to allow for a movement of God in my heart and a movement of God in the body. As a, um, you know, the last uh, commandment mentioned by Jesus or given, it, he didn't mention it, he just flat out said, this is your commandment, is um, to go in the world, into the world and make disciples. So if we're not making disciples again, we ask, why? Is it Jesus' fault? Did he give us a command that's impossible? Is it the fault of the Holy Spirit? Has his, has his empowerment lessened since he empowered the disciples and the people in the early church? Is he unable to fill us with that same power? How often, and this is like pointing fingers back at myself, how often do we repent and recenter. I know for me, I tend to think, well, God's already forgiven me for everything, right? But isn't it good to come before him and admit the things I messed up on and say, God, forgive me for being snarky to that person. Forgive me for not listening when you shoved me in one direction and not going. The quote, small things, that go throughout the day, that happen throughout the day, the occurrences in our lives, they build up. They, um, you know, that, that uh, wall or that, that oppression grows. But when we regularly take it before God and say, God, I did this, forgive me. And repentance, as a lot of you have heard, repentance doesn't just mean saying you're sorry. It means turning around and going in the opposite direction. And that time of kneeling before God is part of that. We pray for movement from the outside instead of on the inside. You know, moving in the body. Lord, help them, help this, help that. Instead of God, move in me. I want to see a movement in my life. I want you to shake me up. I want you to turn me inside out. I want to feel the power and the fire of your Holy Spirit. So let's join together and ask for more. What happens when we ask for more? It can get pretty uncomfortable, right? Um, when I was uh, younger, I grew up in churches where there was always an altar call. You know, every Sunday you sang 
15 verses of just as I am and then four of I surrender all. And it was kind of the sign to, okay, I can doze off now. I mean, that's horrible just admitting. Public confession is good for this all, right? Um, but it was, it was a regular thing. And I think that most of us, I know I did, you kind of saw somebody, you know, dragging themselves down the aisle and you thought, I wonder what they did wrong. You know, what's wrong with them? They either needed to get saved or they were living wrong. And you're kind of watching and going, oh, even though the preacher says every head bowed and every eye closed, you still peek and you still, you know, see what's going on. And I think we've messed that up in our heads. And that's, that's one reason that a lot of churches don't offer offering calls or altar calls every Sunday is we don't want that to lose the impact and different, there's different opinions on that, and there's different sides to that. I know Drew is uh, wanting to do it more, but not every single week so that it doesn't get rote. But what I have come to be convicted about is that an altar call is not for a negative thing. An altar call is for a positive thing. And I believe, and it's proven in scripture and it's proven in people's lives that something happens when we kneel. Now, I, I pray in the shower and driving down the road and in all kinds of weird postures. Uh, but sometimes kneeling before God in a public place, not in a pharisaical way, but being humble has an effect in the spiritual realm. So we are going to, I think, guys, do you have some music for me? Um, I'm going to end in prayer, and then you can sing if you want, but I would like to offer you an opportunity to come and kneel in a, in a public way. If you've got something on your heart you've really been wrestling with, a decision, that you don't know how to make, you don't know where to go, or if your place right now is just a time of real supplication to the Lord for our church, for our neighborhood, for our country, for the world, a call to missions. As um, Bob mentioned, it's NMI, for, we're, we've got to focus on prayer. This altar is not a shameful place. It's a glorious place of putting ourselves in a humble way before God. So let's pray, and then we're going to give that opportunity. God, thank you for being God. Thank you for the victory that you offer and bring into our lives. God, I... Um, I ask you today to do a work in me, to do a work in us as your people. Lord, if someone's here who, who doesn't know you, I ask that this be the day of their salvation. If someone is here walking in some kind of oppression that they're feeling and can't quite put their finger on, I pray that your Holy Spirit ministers to them and that when they walk out of here today, they walk out in freedom. That's your desire, and that's what, you, what Jesus died for, was our freedom. Because Jesus said, who the Son sets free is free indeed. And God, I ask you, please, for a movement from you. Not one that's manufactured or coerced, but one that truly comes from your Holy Spirit. I ask you to touch me. I ask you to touch each individual in this congregation today. The things that block us from hearing your voice, God, I pray that today be the time where those are shed. And Lord, for the things that we've done that do not honor you, we confess them before you and we repent of them. 
for the ways and the times that we're not faithful to your word and faithful to your call, God, we ask your forgiveness. For the times that we don't love enough or rightly, we ask for your forgiveness. For the times that we don't love you like we should, for the times we don't surrender to your call, we ask your forgiveness. For the times that we're kind of mean or selfish, we ask your forgiveness. And God, in that, in that posture, we ask you to please move. We don't want to be stagnant. We don't want our faith to be stale. We want the fresh wind of your Holy Spirit to blow through this place and through our hearts. Thank you that you call us to battle. Thank you that we can answer knowing that we will go forward under your power. And thank you for enabling us to do so. In Jesus' name, and under the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.